Hi guys, welcome to Any Apple Drops, I'm Ben. So this week I wanna do just a really quick video, just a follow up to what we did last week. If you missed it, you can see it here, but we were basically talking about quantum entanglement. Now quantum entanglement is the idea, just to remind you that two particles can be linked in such a way that if you go to do something to one, if you go to take a measurement on one, it will immediately affect any measurements you take on the other. And this is regardless of the distance, these two particles are separated in space. And that is a really weird idea, but What's stranger is the idea that this is always presented to you as a given, that given that you'll have these two entangled particles, but how do you actually produce entanglement? That's what I'm interested in finding out today. How do you actually produce these entangled states? So what I've done is I've come to the Center for Quantum Photonics at the University of Bristol to talk to a man called Jack Carolan, who is trying to build a quantum computer using these entangled states. So it turns out there's a few different ways to produce entanglement. So we'll just be focusing on one, but let's go down to the lab and find out what Jacques does and how he actually does it. So Jacques, tell me a little bit about how you build your entangled photons. So we want to get entangled photons, right? Um, and the way we do that is via a process called um, spontaneous parametric down conversion. Okay, that sounds loads more complicated than it actually is. It's really simple. It's just a process whereby one photon splits into two. So I can show you how we do that over here. Right, because we, um, we get a big laser beam, we fire it at this crystal. So there's a special type of non-linear crystal. When you put light into non-linear materials, weird things happen, okay? And in this particular one, two photons pop up. So what are the important laws of physics, right? Well, there's conservation of energy and there's conservation of momentum. So let's imagine this, this crystal, this non-linear crystal, and I'm gonna fire a photon in it, and it's got some frequency, right? It's got some wavelength. Um, and that tells you about its energy. Okay, so its energy is an H bar over gas. Okay. And then two photons are going to pop off. That guy and that guy. Call them number one and number two. And we know that energy falls will equal energy afterwards. So the energy of these guys must add up to the energy of this guy. So the frequency of these guys is half the frequency of that one. Okay, so that tells you about the energy, this, the energy of this photon tells you what the wavelength is going to be. So we pump it with 400 nanometer light, and the photons that come off are 800 nanometers. Okay, so you send a beam of light into this nonlinear crystal, and each photon that comes in then produces two photons coming out of it. Not, not each one. Some of them. There's a very small probability it's going to happen. But because we've got a big laser that's got trillions of photons in it, you know, you can make that probability appreciable. So we see lots of photons. Conservation of momentum. Right. That's also very important. So if you look around here, right, our input photon is moving that way, okay? So what we don't want to have is two photons coming off here. That's really bad, that physics doesn't like that. So that's actually why we've got two prisms bouncing light off here. The photons come off like that. So at this point we've made our two um, photons by sending in this light into this crystal. Is this is this entanglement? Have we done it? Uh, well, not quite yet. It's not quite the useful entanglement that we need to do something like build a, a quantum computer, okay? Because to understand how you do that, you really need to know something a little bit more about this crystal, just a little bit. And the crystals care about polarization, okay? They care about the way the light moves inside it, all right? So if I imagine I get a crystal, if I input horizontal light, the H, the photons that come out are gonna be vertically polarized. So this is one type of crystal. Okay, I'm gonna call this number one. What I can also do is rotate this guy by 90 degrees. Okay, just take the same one, rotate it by 90 degrees, such that if I input vertical light, okay, the photons that come off will be horizontally polarized. You get one of these and one of these, put them up next to each other, okay, crystal one, crystal two, and you input what we call diagonal light. Okay, diagonal is a mixture of horizontal and vertical. And if you get photons come out, you don't know where, whether they were created in the first crystal or the second crystal. Okay. So you've got to say it's either horizontal or vertical. Okay. And that is an entangled state. So my question is, why can I not just try harder and work out which crystal my photon was actually <laughs> going through? Isn't there some measurement I can do that just tells me 
and makes this just a question of uncertainty as opposed to a question of entanglement. No, no, this is this is quantum physics, okay? This is quantum physics, we're dealing things with photons, okay? Now, in this quantum regime, you have things that are superpositions, right? And this is a superposition. Imagine you've got a coin, okay? If I take a coin out of my pocket and flip it, right? A coin in our classical macroscopic world. In principle, I could pause time and reality and I could work out the momenta of every little bit of the coin and I could work out the air currents that are moving around it. And I could definitely say whether it's going to be heads or tails. That's in principle possible to do, it's just really hard. But with a quantum coin, with a quantum superposition, you can't ever know. It doesn't make sense to say whether it's going to be H or V, heads or tails. And that's the situation we've got here. So last week we saw abstractly what entanglement is, this week we tried to get a more practical idea of what it actually means to create this entangled state. We did this because I wanted to debunk some of that idea that entanglement or quantum things in general are spooky, because they're not. What quantum mechanics comes down to is that there is some physical process which is occurring and you can't know what it is, because as we saw last week as soon as you go to try and take a measurement on it it affects the system, it's no longer that same state. Now when you've created two particles which come from a common source and both have this sort of quantum veil about them, you have to think of them as entangled. Now what this means is that to understand what's happening to one of these photons, you need to consider the entire system. You need to consider both photons regardless of how far apart they are. Now it's precisely because they are a single system that measurement on one will affect the other. And people will call it weird because this idea of a space separated system doesn't happen in classical mechanics. The quantum veil only exists in quantum mechanics. The idea that you can't see what's happening. So you must account for everything. Okay guys, well I hope you enjoyed that. It was just a sort of slightly different look at quantum entanglement than I hope you were used to. If you like this sort of video then do consider subscribing to the channel, the link is over there. And if you have any sort of feedback then definitely leave it in the comment section below, I always read everything that's put there. I'm actually off to America for a few weeks so I'm not entirely sure about what I'm going to do about putting up videos but I will do my best. But anyway, most important thing, have a lovely week and I will see you hopefully next week. Bye!